example, we have, um, well, I should say before, sorry, I just had a message popping up here. I should say that the meeting is live streamed. It is also recorded. If you have any privacy concerns about this, could you please anonymize yourself as much as possible? Um, you will only appear with some sort of um, name as, as you choose in the Q&A section, not in the chat function that's disabled for the, for the audience. Um, so if you anonymize yourself, then, then everything should be fine. If you're, if you're really worried, then please, you, you would need to leave the meeting and then come and um, watch the, the session afterwards. It will, it's live streamed on YouTube and it will be recorded and then um, left there for in perpetuity. Q&A questions, as I said, please put them in the Q&A, um, the questions, put them in the, in the Q&A section. We will, in the background, start, um, a start, um, sorry, ah, right, it's just a, an administrative matter that's popped up. Um, in the background, start collecting questions. While people speaking are speaking, please ping us questions as they pop into your mind because we will have the Q&A session at the very end. Now it is up to me to, with great delight, um, introduce our illustrious panel. We have a guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Brunstetter. He's Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. He holds a PhD in political science um, and he will speak together with Francisco, um, have a conversation with Francisco um, Lobo. He is a postgraduate research student um, at the Department of War Studies at King's College, and he's also one of the stellar members of our research team. He's an international lawyer. They will both be talking about self-determination through the lens of history and international law, a conversation between the two of them. They will then immediately, in the, in the interest of time, be followed without any further interruption by um, Dr. Victoria Hudson, um, she is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow and in the Department of War Studies, also at King's, King's College London. She will be speaking about really exciting research that she's done over several years, um, breaking free of the Russian world, a trajectory of Russian soft power in Ukraine, which is all based on survey results that she has gathered um, in, in particular areas in Ukraine. And if... Paul Schulte, who should be joining us. I'm not entirely sure whether he will, but I am assuming he will join us. If he will join us, he is a senior visiting fellow at King's College um, and an honorary professor at Birmingham University Institute of Conflict, Cooperation and Security. He is a very seasoned um, civil servant who has huge experience in, in matters um, nuclear from nuclear proliferation to all sorts of other security related issues. And here we'll be talking about um, orc ethics, the meaning of Z and the intellectual paternity and implications of violent expansionary rashism um, at the end, at, as the last presentation. After that, we then have our Q&A session, hopefully a lively conversation with everyone. And so without further ado, I hand over to Daniel and Francisco. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to join you on this panel and at this conference. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Bordeaux or Bordeaux, France, where I'm, uh, I'm on a sabbatical working on a project. Uh, normally I would be in Southern California, but uh, here I am on, on European time. Uh, uh, so as Francisco and I started uh, this conversation about self-determination a few months ago uh, in preparation for this, one of the words that came up frequently was the word uh, narrative. Self-determination had different meanings depending upon whose perspective one was taking to any particular conflict. And so I want to begin our presentation, our conversation, by saying a little bit about uh, the word narrative and what narratives mean. Give Francisco a second to put up our slide. So um, narratives are part of the process of constructing identity because they help us to create shared history that produces collective linkages. They contribute to the creation and construction of memories by giving meaning to certain elements of one's past, such as the origin of a people or the trials, tribulations, triumphs, and sometimes failures throughout history, as well as defining present fears and goals which can affect current and, politi and future political actions. Narratives reflect historical events and portray a sense of identity, but are not always factually accurate and often contradict 
other narratives of the same events. Next slide, please. So we're, okay. Um, the slide before, sorry. Uh, so narratives are inevitably selective, whether through the limits of an individual's own experiences or by choice through deliberately placing emphasis on certain historical or cultural elements and or admitting, omitting others. There are what one might call master narratives, which project a sense of group identity and are attached to dominant culture perceptions and institutional actions, such as education and governmental posturing. These often claim to represent truth and tend to be binary, us versus them. On the other hand, there are individual narratives which reflect how different people and or groups perceive events and circumstances, which may sometimes challenge the master narrative. And finally, there is the narrative of the other, which tends to paint the other as the enemy while denying the other a voice to express its own multitude of perspectives. According to leading experts on the study of narrative, the focus on narratives asks us to temporarily set aside questions of right and wrong, and instead focus on the explanatory questions essential to understanding how world politics unfold, and in our particular interest here today, questions regarding self-determination. As this panel unfolds, my hope is that we, uh, the participants and the audience can collectively come up with a list of explanatory questions uh, and maybe some answers along the way as well. That said, I really want to point out and emphasize that not all narratives are equal. They have different uh, senses of power in, in, in the storytelling and in, 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 in international relations. And not all narratives are true or necessarily just. It is up to us through critical and interdisciplinary research to discern what power any particular narrative holds in, spe in a specific conflict and then explore the moral tensions related to questions about justice that might arise. We need to be aware of biases of those who construct the narrative, the omissions, overemphasis of the good bits, distortion of history, negation of facts, and of course, our own biases that we bring to the analysis. Next slide, please. So, the Spanish conquest. Why, you might ask, are we talking about the Spanish conquest of the so-called New World today in this seminar? Well, my own personal narrative is that uh, I have a background in Latin American studies. Francisco and I were chatting about this. He also has a, a background in Latin America. And we were interested in the subject. Um, and uh, this is in part due to some of my early work, which was on uh, this particular moment in history as it relates to just war. But more importantly, because once when I was teaching a class on the ethics of war, I had a student of Tlaxcaltecan origin challenge me in class by asking the following question. What does the Tlaxcaltecan narrative teach us about the just war tradition? So here we are. Uh, Today, I wanted to uh, take on that challenge and in guise of an answer, offer this. Uh, the Tlaxcaltecan is a case uh, where a narrative's approach complicates our intuitions about the rights and wrongs of just war and raises important questions about self-determination that are relevant to contemporary conversations we will be having uh, surrounding Russia and Ukraine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our intuitions are that it was a, an unjust uh, war for the Spanish to conquer the new world, despite, Franc oh, sorry, previous slide, despite Francisco de Victoria's arguments to the counter. Those of you who have studied uh, the just war tradition will be familiar with Victoria's arguments that despite arguing for the quote unquote uh, sovereignty of the quote unquote barbarians, he nevertheless laid out several causes in which the Spanish could uh, wage a just war against the Aztecs, notably to overthrow what he considered as a tyrant and the just war to help one's allies, in this case, the Tlaxcaltecas. Our intuitions uh, are that Victoria's arguments don't hold. We want to side with the Aztecs morally, even if we might disagree with their customs, their polytheistic rituals. We must, in, in some sense, try to put ourselves in the shoes of Cuauhtémoc, who was the last of the Aztec emperors, uh, defending the sovereignty of the Aztecs. And then to put it in the words of, of L'Eclesio, who is a, is a modern day uh, Nobel Prize laureate, he says, we need to imagine the terrible, beautiful, magical world of the Aztecs 
as equally legitimate. And therefore, the Aztecs were waging a just war to defend their own way of life. Um, and you'll see that way of life was also a way of life that was defined by empire. The Aztecs were an expansive empire and they were pushing all across what is considered today Mesoamerica and especially waging perpetual wars against the Tlaxcaltecas. Um, if we take this binary view and our intuitions about it, uh, we're in some ways misled as many scholars have shown that we need to take a broader narrative approach to understand different stories about self-determination that complicate matters. So next slide, please. And so one of the narratives is the narrative of the Tlaxcaltecas. Many of you, uh, might, a few of you might've heard of, of them, most of you probably not, but the Tlaxcaltecas were uh, a group living uh, in, in the same geographical space as the Aztecs. And, their leader at the time of, of the Spanish encounters with New World peoples, Chico Tantla, sorry about the pronunciation, the first, made the choice that in order to maintain and sometimes uh, securitize his, the sovereignty of his people to ally with the Spanish. And the goal of this uh, uh, choice was to defeat the traditional enemy of the Aztecs that was constantly has, uh, harassing them. Um, so in a, in a very oversimplified version of events, by allying with the Spanish, the Tlaxcaltecans defeated their enemy, gained status and privilege in the generations to come as the Aztec imperial period faded and the Spanish imperial period unfolded. So if we privilege their narrative and recognize their agency to make strategic and moral decisions as legitimate, what does this tell us about just war, self-determination, and the rights and wrongs in international relations? Before I get to these questions, before we get to these questions, I wanna emphasize that one thing taking the Tlaxcalteca perspective does not do is it does not negate all the wrongs the Spanish committed, and there are many. But privileging the Tlaxcalteca perspective does reveal a series of tensions we ought to think about. Next slide, please. And these tensions, I'll just mention them, um, not to take up too much time, but they're tensions about uh, questions of empire, oppression, and unjust war, about agency and self-determination uh, in, in the name of, of, of a non-liberal or non-democratic regime, uh, questions about sovereignty protection to protect one's way of life as part of a just war, um, and questions about forfeiture of sovereignty and regime transfer Formation and when, uh, when is in fact a, a war of self-determination unjust. And if we put all these narratives into conversation and try to ask who was on the just side and the unjust side, it raises a series of really important questions that I hope we're going to discuss uh, uh, that I think are important in the current context as well. So next slide, please. And in, in the, the interest of time, I'll just throw these questions out there and then turn things over to Francisco who will bring us up to the present day. Whose agency matters most in this context? The Tlaxcaltecas, the Spanish, the Aztecs? Which narratives matter and how do they matter? And what is the relationship between self-determination, ethics and international law? Uh, on to you now, Francisco. Excellent. Thank you so much, Daniel. I hope you can hear me. If not, please let me know. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll take over from here. We will be talking about international law a little bit as a result, uh, in a way, of this history. Uh, it's interesting that you uh, cited Francisco de Vitoria because he's one of the main uh, authors of international law, the, the early uh, centuries of modern international law. So the principle of self-determination as a, as a cornerstone uh, standard in modern uh, contemporary international law has uh, an interesting history. Uh, it's more technical or legal history as a source of international law. I will briefly summarize here. We can find it in, uh, well, after war, uh, the First World War in Wilson's 14 points. We find it again uh, at the UN Charter as uh, one of the main principles of the, of the new organization back in 45. Again, the UN endorses this principle in the 60s, uh, referring to colonial peoples and uh, their right to self-determination. Uh, it is linked in the 60s as well with not only de decolonization, but also with human rights. So it, it is part of uh, that sub-regime of interna international law. Um, 
it is also uh, mentioned again in this very important resolution uh, by the General Assembly on uh, friendly relations and principles of international law. Um, it is recognized as a just cause, uh, just cause, I'm sorry, or legitimate cause for war uh, in additional Protocol One of the Geneva Convention. So it is uh, acknowledged as a, a type of international armed conflict to fight for independence and self determination against colonial uh, or racist regimes. The, those are the words used in the protocol. Uh, moving on, uh, very recently, the International Law Commission has suggested this uh, principle of self-determination as an example of a Yuskogen's rule that is a very important uh, uh, rule hierarchically in the, in the tree of uh, international law sources. And uh, more recently, the International Court of Justice uh, has said that this principle has the status also of a customary rule of international law. So this is just to say that um, it is a part of international law, self-determination as both a principle and a customary rule, and even with this high hierarchy or high status that is a use Gogan's uh, uh, condition. Um, so it is, it is definitely part of international law today, again, as a result of this uh, historic development that Daniel was talking about. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna uh, like spend too much time uh, on, on the different types of self-determination according to the literature. I don't think that's uh, what uh, interests us today. Uh, uh, we are here to talk about practice. So, but uh, uh, there is a, a division between external and internal self-determination, whether you are free to govern yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis a different uh, political community or within your own political community. Uh, and then we have other types of self-determination, but that, that's the main uh, division, I would say, or, or um, classification, external or internal. Um, but I wanted to, to come back to Daniel's point about narrative's intention. Uh, so he was talking about that, that tension back in the day of the Spanish Empire, right, like 500 years ago. But we still have narrative's intention when it comes to self-determination today. And I, I wanted to briefly address uh, each of these types of uh, narrative that I have identified, especially when it comes to the case of Ukraine. Uh, as a nice segue maybe to what uh, the other panelists are gonna talk about. So, um, okay, we have established that self-determination is a part uh, of international law. It's a source, it's very important. It even has Yuskogen status. So it's definitely very, very important. Um, but what does it mean? We don't have an exact definition. We don't have a legal definition. We don't have a, a treaty defining uh, uh, self-determination or a definitive uh, authoritative uh, ruling by a court defining it. So uh, I would say that uh, it's basically empty uh, in, in a Kantian way. So my Immanuel Kant is a bit rusty, I'm sorry, but I do remember that his uh, formulations of the imperative, uh, the, the categorical imperative, were kind of empty. That was Hegel's critique uh, against Kant, actually. Uh, so yeah, we're free to self-determine, to self-govern, but it doesn't say anything about the, the way of life we're supposed to choose, right? Uh, it's only with the second formulation of the imperative that Kant uh, introduces some content uh, in the way, in the, in the form of human dignity, uh, or not to treat others as mere objects, right? So we are supposed to flesh out or, or provide some content. Uh, uh, for this uh, empty formula that is self-determination. And some contents are better than others. That's my contention, at least. I don't know uh, if Daniel shares this view, but uh, in, my, in my view, some contents are, are actually worse uh, than uh, uh, others. So uh, this is one example, uh, what I call authoritarian self-determination. Um, so earlier this year, Russia and China uh, early in, in early February, they, they issued a joint statement about international relations, international law, um, COVID, the Olympics, they covered everything. And uh, they, they referred to democracy and self-determination. And they said, well, democracy is really, it really depends on the historic context and the traditional values that the community uh, has. And uh, the community can decide to be a democracy or not. It's, it's up to the community. So uh, it's, it's, um, uh, a very, very interesting take on the link or lack thereof between self-determination and democracy. Um, so it could, my point is authoritarian regimes, and uh, again, my contention is that Russia and China are, um, they could use also self-determination uh, uh, in their own advantage and uh, to, to actually curtail uh, democracy and uh, human rights. Uh, 
Um, we can also see that modern uh, democracies where the rule of law exists, uh, like for instance here in the UK, can still use this narrative of self-determination to, um, again, um, advance or um, perpetuate uh, some, some uh, views of history that we're not all comfortable with uh, as in imperialistic views of history. So uh, to put it more simply, the Brits have used the principle of self-determination, the same principle, to justify their presence in the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas in, in South America, the Chagos Islands, uh, uh, and a bunch of other overseas territories. Why? Because they say, well, the, the population, they are the ones who want to um, uh, be part of our commonwealth so or our uh, political community. So we are just applying the, the principle of self-determination. So uh, this content is also one of the, one of the um, not desirable contents of self-determination. I would say that uh, a robust sense of uh, self-determination as the one we can see uh, in the Badinter Commission referring to the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, where you have democracy, human right, respect for human rights, the rule of law, that is the kind of self-determination we should be uh, aiming for. That is what I believe to be a robust sense of self-determination. Um, but yeah, since I'm running out of time, I will just leave it there. Hopefully we can connect this uh, to uh, the, the construction of identity uh, in the current conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And for that, I will just hang over to, uh, hand over to um, Victoria Hudson and I'll just stop sharing my screen. Oh, someone did it for me. Uh, excellent, <laughs> thank you. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks Francisco, and uh, thanks to all for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel today. I will just quickly share my screen. Okay, hopefully that should be visible now, but do let me know if not. So um, yeah, my contribution to this discussion on self-determination, well, it's clear to see that um, the idea of um, breaking free of Russia's cultural orbit, it's an expression of Ukraine's will for self-determination and to, to free itself of the Russian world that people sometimes feel has been actually imposed upon it and um, to find its own independent narratives. And today, this is the, the very first chance I've had to share some of uh, my findings from the ongoing fieldwork um, for my postdoc. Um, the surveys were run in um, the autumn to sort of early spring of, of this year, and um, very much just uh, finished quite shortly before the, the war. <coughs> So firstly, to um, explain my approach to this study of um, soft power. Um, overall, I'm looking at how um, the Kremlin itself operationalizes and approaches what I'm calling soft power, but it doesn't necessarily look at it through that particular lens, but it does operationalize um, in terms of cultural, ideational uh, influence albeit not always in the sort of more voluntaristic way that we associate with soft power. So in the research, I'm looking, what are the narratives that Russia tries to promote about itself, about the world? What interpretive filters does it want foreign citizens to apply in interpreting um, these things? And um, what values and pre-assumptions do audiences need to hold to buy into Russian um, narratives? I look in my research at the channels of communicating with um, audiences, take a broad approach to that. But um, what's perhaps um, a bit unusual about my approach is I also look at the, the audience, they're foregrounded in my research. And rather than being seen as um, vessels ready to be um, filled with propaganda, propaganda content, um, audience members are seen as active, active participants in the communication process. And they exert friction upon the communication, upon the narratives that they receive. Um, that obviously shapes their reception of the, the, the strategic narratives that, that are directed at them. So the friction can, turn, can relate to the credibility of the speaker, the sort of strength of the 
communication, uh, own personal experiences, those of friends, family, um, identity choices, and of course, ex exposure and receptivity to alternative discourses, um, which might be seen to boost what we can call resilience. Now, all these factors hand together and interact, reinforce, dilute each other. It's quite hard to, to tease them apart. So in that sense, it's quite difficult to draw a line of causality between any given communication and a particular outcome in terms of audience um, reception. Um, you know, there are many factors, but the, what this study is, it's kind of like a dipstick. It says, what, is, what do people think about these things? at this moment in time, acknowledging that there can be many factors contributing to that. Um, and essentially, they, if there's a, a favourable um, reception, that's going to be positive for Russian foreign policy possibilities, regardless of the reasons. Um, and of course, how do audiences receive those um, messages positively? Do they sympathise? Do they express excitement, interest? Do they resonate with them? Do they reproduce the narratives in their own um, communications or do they reject, undermine, criticize, ridicule, express irony? And that feeds into behaviors, whether it's um, active discipleship perhaps, or maybe tacit um, passive consent more commonly, or are they motor motivated to resist? And um, how far? That's the sort of the background of my approach. Um, in assessing audience reception in my postdoc overall, I've taken a, a mixed methods approach to triangulate the re results between the surveys, um, which uh, assess the, uh, it gives basically um, a series of statements that are expressed in Russian um, public diplomacy and asks participants to evaluate them and express their agreement or disagreement on a five point Likert scale. So one is a sort of strong disagreement, five strong agreements, and three is more sort of ambivalent. And overall in the postdoc, we've got about uh, 2000 valid responses from the three participating um, countries, um, it's Estonia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine in um, 2021 and 22. And these are triangulated with focus groups in the same countries, about 24. The, the data is still coming in from those, mostly gathered, but not yet analysed. Um, so, yeah, this is Ukraine. Clear. I'm sure it's a familiar map now. In, um, in 2011, when I ran this similar survey, just focusing on Ukraine um, in four cities, um, Lviv in the west of the country, Kiev, the capital, Kharkiv um, and Donetsk, both in the eastern regions. Um, obviously, in 21-22, uh, it was not possible to run this very same survey in Donetsk. So we looked instead at um, Odessa. So we did the survey in Odessa. Unfortunately, the war broke out before we were able to run the focus groups there. But we did still get eight focus groups from the other three cities. So yeah, looking to the, um, the samples that we gathered, overall it was um, a smaller sample in 2011, um, but um, in both years, slight majority of females, which for various reasons for that, quite familiar in the social sciences and particularly in this region. And most people, almost like 99% were citizens of Ukraine. They should be citizens or permanent residents to participate. And most people actually self-identified as Ukrainian already in 2011, but even more so in 2021. And people familiar with the, um, the census figures of Ukraine, outdated though they are, um, might express some, might raise their eyebrows at these, and I'm happy to discuss that at a later stage in the questions. So then um, looking at the results of the, the um, of the survey, this is the overall, this is the headline figures actually. It's an average of the scores for questions about culture, values, foreign policy, and the social economic attraction of Russia. Um, what, the blue at the bottom, that indicates they had a low level of attraction 
their average score over all those questions was less than 2.5. Uh, median bands, um, quite considerable in 2011, so 2.5 to uh, 3.5, a clustering around the middle, as we might often expect. And then those grey ones at the top, those are the ones that expressed a really quite consistently high level of um, receptivity, positivity towards the statements that were proposed to them. And it's really clear that over that decade, um, the level of acceptance of Russia's cultural narratives has, um, has decreased very significantly. Um, looking more specifically at the cultural questions here, just going to quickly check the time, I'm mindful of that. Um, <clears throat> so culture is kind of seen as a forefront in public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, soft power. Um, Overall, the difference in cities is less than in um, 2020, 2011. And um, when it comes to the sort of supposedly pro-Russian cities, we can see that more people have a negative attitude, less people have a positive attitude. It's um, quite interesting to look at Lviv, although it's still relatively unfavorable, and it's um, very skeptical city as regards Russia. I mean, it's perhaps a little less unfavorable. Um, there's been relative positive change there, perhaps. Maybe we can talk about the role of cultural diplomacy um, and so on. But at the same time, Kiev remains relatively steady on issues of culture. So this is quite an interesting development. Um, as regards to questions about values, um, in 2011, there was a relatively low level of rejection of those values, of those um, issues, perhaps because they were more general statements. They didn't actually reference um, Russia specifically, but rather just the positions that Russia tries to stand for in um, international politics in that sphere. Um, we can perhaps come back to that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on individual points. But just to show that you know, it breaks down quite interestingly, also with regard to foreign policy, much greater rejection across the board, including in those um, cities that are often seen as pro-Russian, um, generally much greater rejection. And socioeconomic attraction, is really, that was perhaps a little bit of a surprise. Um, this is perhaps one where the um, level of disillusionment with Russia is highest. Um, yeah, so 85% overall um, turning out to be in the, the, the low bands and 69% scoring an average of less than two. Um, so an interim conclusion, um, attraction of Russia among the target sample population has declined. But meanwhile, the intra-Ukrainian differences also appear to be to be shrinking, which is quite interesting. Um, for instance, the, the correlation coefficients between like city of study and the scoring of individual questions have dropped from sort of moderate to moderately strong, saying that there was quite a strong correlation between which city you were studying in and whether you had a high or low a level of attraction to Russian points of view, as judged by the survey. Um, but in the recent study, it was more sort of moderate to weak, really. And this was the case across the board, all the questions, really. I don't think there were any where there was greater division between cities. And, and there was a significant minority of variables um, where there wasn't actually a statistically significant difference between the cities at all. So that's quite interesting. Um, because Ukraine has traditionally been seen as a city that is um, very, got a lot of regional diversity, but certainly among this tar target population and on the issues that I've asked about, that seems to be sort of shrinking. And um, this trend is particularly holds particularly true for the questions relating to Ukraine, specifically to Ukraine, which is like a fifth, a fifth strand of questions that weren't included in those previous averages. So this, this summarizes people's responses to the statements, Ukraine and Russia should cultivate close and friendly ties reflecting their common history. So um, 
it's a bit, it's a bit unfortunately labeled really, but the um, sort of Ukrainian colors towards the top of the charts indicate that people were agreeing with um, that statement by giving a four or five score. Um, so we can look to Donetsk and approximately 70% either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. But then looking over to 2021, clearly the, that statement is um, much less appealed to people, even in, um, let's say, the most pro-Russian cities, um, Kharkiv, Odessa, I know we're talking um, like only 40% accepting those statements. Um, here, just another one to demonstrate the statement. President Yushchenko was uh, wrong to recognize Stepan Bandera as a hero of Ukraine. It's a rather controversial figure traditionally in, Ukra in Ukraine. Um, from the, the Russians sort of Soviet perspective, this was, say, you know, a, a Nazi. A, a fully, they consider his followers to be neo Nazis, uh, those who lionize him. But from the Ukrainian patriotic perspective, the emphasis is much more on his role in fighting for Ukrainian independence. So, um, <clears throat> obviously quite a lot of disagreements and ambivalence about this question in Kharkiv and Donetsk in 2011, very low level of acceptance, uh, very, very low level of disagreement with that statement, contrast very strongly with Lviv, for example, um, where 80% um, disagree. They find that he should, they support really strong shift of opinions in, um, in 2021. Um, it's really interesting to note that there's um, a very strong correlation or a moderately strong correlation um, between people's um, schools on Russian soft power generally, the four strands and their views on Russian perspectives towards Ukraine. Um, the correlation is stronger, um, as well as the overall mean scores have reduced. So we can see a, a much more homogenization of views. Well, it's also interesting to note that over the decade between the two surveys, um, political engagement among, among the highly educated Ukrainian youth has really increased quite dramatically. These scores related to stated level of interest in politics, uh, importance of voting, present level of involvement in political activities, information distribution, political campaigns, and their stated readiness to participate in um, societal activities to initiate political change. So, um, but there isn't, interestingly, a particularly strong correlation between political engagement and um, the overall Russian soft power score. Yeah. So what do we know about these um, very quickly um, pro-Russian uh, Ukrainians? So largely from the East, most of them do identify as Ukrainians, um, unsurprisingly perhaps, because there was a low level of Russians actually identified in this survey, but there's um, a strong, the role of Russian speaking is very important. Uh, quite interesting, these linkages. 20% have a 26% have a preference for Russian language media. You might find that's quite low, but it compares with 10% for those who had a low or medium um, Russian soft power score. 28% um, not fluent in Ukrainian, that's um, far higher than the other groups. Less likely to access online media. 50% um, sometimes or often watch Russian television, Russian based, which is 12% for those with a low score. They've been more likely to spend a longer period of time in Russia. A large number of them have um, family in Russia, of which 40% are in close contact, and 27% have participated in activities organized by the Russian community versus 10% among other groups. I'm going to skip over quickly over this one, but can talk about it if desired. So interim conclusions, we don't know the direction of causality. Do these kind of linkages um, encourage a person to have pro-Russian attitudes? Or if they've got those attitudes, are they more likely to you know, go to Russia? It's likely to be iterative, greater receptivity, confirmation bias. 
it's, it's a complicated relationship um, for sure. And we'll be exploring in greater depth. But what's interesting to mention is what's really driven these changes. Um, or perhaps it's not surprising that many people consider themselves to be Ukrainians rather than Russians. And this is a young generation, not only born and bred in Ukraine themselves, but of parents who came of age in independent Ukraine. Clearly, Russia's actions um, have made the expression of pro-Russian sentiments quite problematic. And to fit, you know, this is a country that portrayed itself as um, a brotherly nation meant to engage in a war against it. It's hard to make sense of that. The objective negative consequences of Russian actions, such as clearly loss of life, loss of livelihoods, displacement, um, reduction in Ukrainian GDP, all the consequences from that. Ukrainianization measures are likely to play a strong role um, so promoting the, Russia, um, the Ukrainian language, restrictions on Russian media in Ukraine, and the quite interesting factor of the decline of the pro-Russian um, Ukrainian oligarch. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, Renat Akhmetov was one of the major backers of the former president um, Yanukovych, who was ousted in the 2014 revolution. He was seen as rather pro-Russian. Um, but Mr. Akhmetov was one of the major victims um, of um, the loss of territory in the east of Ukraine. Um, so uh, to express a pro-Russian opinion, that was a very useful thing um, at a certain point in time. There was, a, there was a constituency for elections to elect candidates on that basis, but that's become much more problematic now, um, understandably. And um, so, whereas for many reasons previously, um, there were also sort of pragmatic financial reasons um, rather than sort of cultural or political reasons, often the gatekeepers allowed a flow of the so called pro Russian ideas into Ukraine, um, whether that was just by buying media content or reproducing Russian ideas about the role of the Russian language. Um, among the population, but now the, the drawbridge has really been drawn up against that. Um, it's seen as unacceptable, even traitorous, um, to reproduce those kind of ideas. So the ground in that sense is much clearer for pro-Ukrainian patriotic ideas to flourish as they seem to be doing among the, um, the young people uh, in, in my survey. And um, yeah, that's... Um, probably the main points I want to make today and I'm happy to take questions but in the meantime I will hand over to um, Paul Schulter for his presentation. Close enough. Um, is that visible now as the slideshow beginning? Um, no, Paul, I can't see a slideshow at all. Well, I've pressed, pressed share slide. How do I get um, my slide show, slide deck is open on my computer. How do I get? Have you got, the, uh, I, if you go down to share screen at the bottom of your um, window, there's a green button. Yeah, I had pressed that. I'll press it again. And if you go to, so you need to highlight this, the, the presentation that pops up because you will have various um, yeah, I do. images and you need to highlight that. And then once that's highlighted, that should come up for all of us to see. Which I've done. It's, it's now popped up again on my screen. I'm sorry about why this is not happening. Um, is that- Ah, now I can, ah. Well, <laughs> I can see your Twitter. Yeah, that's not that interesting. And New York let's, Times. Let's see if I can from now. There's oh, something we, happening here. Right. Yay! Okay. Thank here you. Here we go. All so I, um, I wanted to talk about um, a, a, an important ethical and geopolitical issue: the the small uh, operation going on in Ukraine and what it means and how it is being explained. 
uh, and justified. We're talking ethics. Um, and so I want to talk about these evolving moral claims, but also behind them, what is actually revealed about the ethical choices about the Russian elite. And I, I have the, I use this notion of the collective Putin. We don't know exactly who that is at any moment. I'm not assuming, so I'm going the opposite way from the pre preceding presentation in a way. I'm looking at statements by the elite rather than revealed um, measured attitudes amongst the public. And I don't believe that the elite believe all they say. I don't think they even expect to be believed. I'm not proposing all Russians agree with that, or there is a single review, a uh, single view. Uh, that there, there are people who say a lot and may not matter very much to the, the choices of the Russian state. And, and to be clear, because I go through this um, uh, set of moral arguments, it doesn't mean that I endorse or are sympathetic to them. Um, so Z is rather important. It's got meanings um, in, in the wider world and certainly within Russia as a certain sense of um, identity uh, almost produced by the state and, and constantly emphasized by the state. If you don't support the special military operation, you're not a proper Russian. You are, you, you are uh, a long way to being a traitor. And this kind of dehumanization is running high in in this war. If if you look at the samples I've seen of statements, um, each side sees the other as as um, conditioned by propaganda, sinister forces. Both sides call the other zombies, um, and the Russians even themselves talk about the zombie box. They're aware of what TV says. Um, and you can find samples of intercepted conversations which, which prove that. But what is what I what started me thinking is that only the Ukrainians see themselves as at war with orcs. Um, and orcs are subhuman, they're malign, they're destructive, they're murderous, and there are huge numbers of them, and nothing will stop them except killing them. And so you you find these official uh, statement saying a squad of orcs has been repelled. And this woman, uh, who's probably now dead, uh, a, a female Ukrainian sniper, uh, insists we must kill them all. And no doubt she she did her best before probably being killed herself. And this this is a Manichean universe, um, uh, drawing on Tolkien, but also Christian iconography. Um, uh, virtuous Ukrainians are fighting Russian orcs, assisted by Saint Saint Javelin, and there's now a Saint Enlaw, I think, who, who, who've, who've come in on, on the virtuous side. Um, but I, my point is there is a there is a, a, an, a what attempts to be a coherent moral system uh, legitimating the Orcs. Um, you can trace its lineage, which I try and touch on very briefly, uh, and it's continually being elaborated. Um, it, it, it's trying to recuperate any any challenge to it. We didn't pay enough attention to it. We didn't in, in the years before the the the, the, the special military operation um, in the West. The Ukrainians did, but we thought it couldn't be true. They couldn't possibly mean this, um, and it relies on many ab fairly abstract resentments and grievances. Um, and uh, it's but those grievances are much much less. Uh, intense than now Ukraine's. Um, and the Ukrainians call this system Russianism, Russian fascism, a portmanteau, portmanteau word. Um, it has to do with a Russian, holy Russian exceptionalism, Russian endurance. Um, it's, it, it's innocent, non-aggressive character, the way it's been uh, attacked and thwarted by others. And um, nevertheless, Russia has been great, can be great again by bold leaders, not put off by suffering. Russians are good at suffering. They emphasize that. Uh, suffering, whether it's suffered or inflicted, is, is okay. Bold leaders need to do it, uh, to, to choose it. And they need to do it because we need a post-Western world. The international system is unfair. It's dominated by the West. Uh, that spreads all sorts of perversion and uh, uh, liberal skepticism. The world has not changed with international law fundamentally. Hard power must be part of what good Russian leaders will do. If you don't, you're betraying the future of the Russian people, the Russian world. And so Russia has to lead in pushing for that post-Western uh, post -Western world in every possible sphere. And there's now a po present, there's now a global crisis. Um, Ukraine is just one example of that. Uh, in this crisis, uh, the 
virtues of solidarity and spiritual security and, and, and proper cleansing of information are, are more important than ever. Internal traitors, which includes the Ukrainian leadership, who, who, who refused to accept they were part of the Russian world, they must be punished. Um, and they, their illegitimate state should, should be abolished. Um, that's a maximalist view, which may now, as I'll say, be changing. And to be weak or sentimental or credulous is, is a betrayal of, of, of Russia and Russian people. And of course, in this situation, preceding treaties in international law no longer automatically apply. And this creates an interesting case in kind of moral um, argumentation. It's, it's a, a supreme emergency to Russia's except, exceptional status, but it's an impending supreme emergency. There isn't actually an invasion, but there might be. Russia's position in the world might be so seriously menaced that it loses what it's entitled to. And that means, for all these um, uh, additional reasons, um, the, the, the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, discrimination and violence allegedly against Russian-speaking Ukrainians, the damage to Russia's proper global position if Ukraine moved, um, it's West's fault because they ignored Russia's repeated warnings and uh, they're making, and, and they say, Western theorists like Mearsheimer themselves say that uh, NATO has made war an offensive realistic inevitability. And also the, this um, uh, real politic argument that Russia needs to deter other states from trying any similar movement. And behind that is a, is a sort of straight propaganda claim, Russia, that Ukraine was working on nuclear and biological warfare before the invasion. We haven't heard much of that since. So forcible de demilitarization was indispensable. And it's, this, was a, this makes it a strong ad bellum case. And anyway, Russian public opinion largely agrees with it. Um, and states with more than half of the world's global population in the UN have refused to condemn Russia. So that's the kind of democratic um, aspect to it. And there's an, a, a religious uh, ingredient. The Russian Orthodox Church has more or less blessed the war, partly because it's a, it's a war against um, a, a gay pride and, 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 and liberal perversity. And it, they, they endorse the idea that this is, this is a, we're in a global emergency. And you've always had these people like Dugin for years, who may not be Putin's brain, as they were said to be a few years ago, but they have this worked out um, doctrine of Russia, again, being very different, special, and entitled to a huge geopolitical presence in the world, in which Ukraine, to which Ukraine is a major threat. It's an abs He was saying as long ago as 1997, and his book, The Foundation of Geopolitics, is read by all Russian has been read by all Russian generals in staff college. And he takes this uh, Schmittist approach that, that Russia has to bring down the, 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 the global hegemonic international legal and economic system. Otherwise, its, it's destiny cannot be assured. And it, and it can't even con continue in its, in its present power. But what's happened is that this, this very big uh, uh, Ukraine-related justification has receded as, as the war's gone wrong. They're, f they're calling up other theorists like Lukyanov, who's saying uh, this, is, this is now an attempt to bring down the international system, which we have to do because of the selfishness of liberal leaders after the Cold War. Uh, Russia's, like as in 1917, is, is kind of bringing, uh, defending the future of the world, changing the future of the world, no matter what it costs. It's a brave vanguard nation. Dmitry Trenin, who used to be a relative liberal, is now saying what's happening as the war's gone on, uh, because the West is increasing its its involvement, it's in effect de trying to destroy Russia's world uh, role in the world. And to do this, uh, uh, we can't give in in Ukraine because otherwise the hybrid war will move into into Russia, and we must win. The important task is to achieve strategic success, which clearly means some kind of military success in Ukraine. So all those arguments are now being changed and strengthened. And to turn to Ad Bell in Bello, how the orcs actually behave. Well, here I think that the playbook is quite clear. Russians must always be assumed to be behaving well. Everyone is lying. Uh, Russia's not saying it doesn't lie, but everyone does. Um, nothing's true. Everything is possible. It, whatever happened a long time ago, and besides, it never happened. Um, everything must be disputed. 
uh, collateral damage, shit happens. Um, so no reported Russian disciplinary action over war crimes. The constitution, constitution, they can't extradite anyone. And we get this interesting, immediate, angry historical relativism. Whatever we do, um, we're entitled to do it because the Americans have done worse. Um, and they they talk about um, uh, the, the numbers of deaths in Libya, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and very angrily insist, we must always bring this up. That's what we have to do. And we are going to, uh, then this proportionality argument, um, we, we're entitled to th threaten to blow up the world with nuclear weapons because this is so important, even though it's not a war. We're entitled to starve millions in the third world. We're entitled to do what we have to do against civilians. But we must also, and this would be part of what I take to be the code of orc ethics is to preserve our power. We we will do many of these things, but we must never we must never accept uh, that we've done them because that would be to diminish our rightful power in the world, and it's going to get worse uh, because Russia is now expecting uh, an insurgency. Um, it will explain this as Ukrainian NATO NATO hybrid warfare. And to deal with it, it's going to do what its doctrine requires it to do, uh, what it did in Chechnya, Syria, and Georgia. And so we should get ready for all the apparatus of authoritarian peace building and population control. We're already seeing filtration camps, ideological re-education. They've removed all the textbooks, uh, historical textbooks in Ukrainian schools they've captured. Net mass just deportation, as under Stalin, and this interesting new word, herbicide, the, the utter destruction of cities that resist, uh, Aleppo, Grozny, and now Mariupol. And that's going to be harsh, but, we'll say the Russians, are beginning to say, at least these things work, this approach works, unlike the, the, unlike the way the West have lost Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, millions of deaths there, and to what end? You lost. So we, we're not going to use that um, Namby Pamby approach, and indeed the the, the ultra naturalists like the Senator Gherkin um, are saying you're wimps. Uh, the government is not being tough enough. So there will be plenty of voices within Russia saying we have to we have to push harder. And um, anyway, most humanitarian arguments are just uh, dis thinly disguised uh, li liberal um, self pleading. So to to uh, to conclude, uh, th what we've seen is um, an atomization of the huge gap, which I think we all already have noted and felt between Russian and Western moral judgments, let alone Ukrainian judgments. Um, this is a huge collision um, in in many dimensions, and the Russians will make it spread into as many dimensions as they can. Um, we won't see quickly it, its full effect on international relations. But if we think about the future, um, given what we already know, um, so many deaths, so many lies, um, what forgiveness? After such knowledge, what forgiveness? I think that's T.S. Eliot. And in the future, it's not going to go away like Nazi, the real Nazism went away after uh, after the Third Reich because a nuclear Russia cannot be forcibly liberalized. Um, every, you know, Western leaders keep repeating that in talking of off ranks. So we are going to have to think about coexistence without reconciliation, ethical softening, or even agreement on on the facts of Z, who what caused it, how did both sides behave. So we should expect lasting moral disgust associated with inevitably with distrust from what the West will see as Russian denials, callousness, and sacred exceptionalism, but also expect reciprocal Russian resentment at hypocritical Western superiority. And th these attitudes, partly intellectual, partly emo very, very emotional, will become in themselves a divisive geopolitical factor, which, of course, Dugin and his the Eurasianists, who, who want this complete cleavage between um, uh, authentic, soulful, uh, telluric Russian holy civilization in the West will be completely pleased, pleased by. This is this this sort of emotional and ethical curtain, it won't be iron, it will be something else, um, is exactly what they hope for in the future of Eurasia. So that I think is the meaning of Z at the moment. Finished. Thank you very much, Paul. That was uh, 
an exciting, incredibly speedy ride through your Yes, I would like to introduce to you to some of those interesting and ho largely horrible people that I was uh, bringing up because we should be aware of them, but in, in, I'd, uh, more later for anyone who wants it. Yeah, I think we all would have had, ha have already got millions of questions to ask you and would love to have another two hours to, to discuss everyone's presentations. Um, alas, we have 13 minutes. Um, let's start with one question that we have. So while the audience is trying to digest um, Vicky's and Paul's presentation, let's go back to um, a question on Daniel's and Francisco's, Francisco's um, um, question. Um, and that is, I'm researching international humanitarian law and listening to the presentations this morning, it occurs to me that understanding what lies underneath competing narratives is the key to the mediation of a peace process. If this idea is worthy of comment, oh yeah, it is worthy of comment, absolutely. Thank you very much. It is a really good question. So competing narratives um, and the fate of peace processes, which of course, if feel free to pick up on some of the themes that Paul has just raised and some of the findings Victoria has presented on which narratives have lost currency in Ukraine and in which areas and which ones are still very much alive. So over to, I don't know, Daniel and Francisco. I'm not sure who would like to go first. Daniel, you wanna go first? Uh, sure, uh, a, a very interesting and important question. I'll just offer a quick uh, dive into it. Um, I think one of the things to consider is when you're talking about peace processes, if the narratives are, are so far apart and one narrative requires the total destruction or annihilation of the other, what does that tell us about the perspectives of peace? So if, you, if you're looking at some of the conclusions one might draw about competing narratives based on Paul's presentation, a narrative, uh, a Russian narrative in which Ukraine ceases to exist doesn't create the conditions for a peace process that Ukraine is going to accept. And so I think when we look at narratives, we need to understand at what point there might be potential overlap for certain parties that, um, to, to find consensus on, on narratives that they might accept. As the conflict described by Paul right now is, is settling into this, this competing narratives in which one side will prevail over the other, I'm not sure that um, that kind of a peace process is possible right now. Just Thank you very much. Francisco, would you like to? Very quickly, I think it also comes down to agency. So if within your narrative, you don't have agency, whether because you, you gave it up because you want to be a victim or be seen, perceived as a victim, and you're comfortable with that, or because it was taken away from you, it's very difficult for you to have a say in the negotiating table for the peace process. So someone's going to make the decision for you. It could be an occupying power, the, the allies, the UN, uh, the Americans, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you if in your narrative, you have agency and you have a just cause and, and also own your actions because agency also comes with responsibility. So if you say, you know what, we also messed up, we also made mistakes, we also committed war crimes even, but we're, we're going to take care of that. Uh, that changes things, I think. Uh, so um, a narrative of agency, I think, uh, has a better prospect of uh, um, uh, for, for everybody involved within a peace process. Thank you, Francisco. Um, the, I, I, I think both of you have made really important points. The question after Paul's presentation and the question I would have to Paul is if you have not only two completely and totally and utterly irreconcilable narratives, but also one of the narratives and one of the philosophies driving action really is the utter destruction of the other side, there is nowhere to go. So are we basically on a, a, a track which gives us no no off-ramp at all, and which will end in basically nuclear exchange, because if utter destruction is what Russia wants, then <laughs> nuclear weapons use is pretty much guaranteed that utter destruction. So even in the most 
I don't like the using the word evil, but even in the most self-destructive philosophy, there must be a smidgen of wanting to survive because what otherwise is the point? You might as well kill yourself instantly. So yeah. there are there are logics which are so irreconcilable, even within themselves, that it's totally impossible to see where we go from here and what the future holds. The future then, to me, holds pretty much self-destruction. I don't think it's as bad as that. Um, I think that the Russians wanted the annihilation of uh, the Ukrainian state. Um, they still will still want it, but they have begun to recognize, at least at the moment, the present correlation of forces, to use the Russian phrase, um, which will get worse. Uh, it's not attainable. It could be attainable by, by conventional means. Um, it might be attainable by nuclear means, but the Russians have not indicated that they are willing to suffer, to risk, seriously risk the nuclear annihilation of Russia to achieve destruction of Ukraine. And besides, there are all these inconvenient geopolitical realities, geophysical realities, like the way the winds blow westwards, carrying radioactivity into, into Russia. That all sorts of... <laughs> reasons not to fire nuclear weapons at Ukraine. So they'll go on fighting until they stop fighting and they will not, it looks as though they're going to have to make some kind of an ugly peace, which will be painful for the Ukrainians as well, though they say they won't accept it. So um, sort of battlefield, battlefield exhaustion, Clausewitzian friction, if you like, will, will I think Im impose a halt to hostilities, at least for the next few years. What I, I, I'm going to ask Vicky to come in into the conversation in a minute as well, but just one more question to, to Paul. What I've noticed is in the course of your presentation, it became more and more about Russia wanting to destroy Western philosophy and political dominance. And the West has already, as Ukrainian allies, cast some of its actions as actually, yes, we're helping the Ukrainians, but we are fighting Russia. So yeah. in a sense, there is an odd, weird, hybrid, um, sorry, proxy war type narrative in, wrapped up in all of this as well. But if Russia is intent on destroying the West with its philosophy and dominance and cultural influence, then clearly that is, it cannot be satisfied with what it then would have to consider to be a tactical victory just in or a tactical reason for a tactical ceasefire in Ukraine. It can't, it can't in the long run be satisfied, no. Um, but it can perfectly decide um, that in, the, in this phase of this long conflict, uh, this is the best we can get. Uh, so an ugly, this, this phrase, the ugly piece, ugly in terms of Russian uh, yeah, yeah. aspirations and, and Ukrainian aspirations, to, because to get it, both sides would have to compromise. Um, and I think it's it's not quite true to say that Russia wants to destroy the West. Russia wants to displace the West from its dominant position in the international order. And in that, it is going to count on the support of the non-West, which above all will include China. But plenty of other countries want to see the West displaced, which is why they... Um, and, and, and refuse to be drawn into the Western narrative about a confrontation of good and evil, which is why there's been such equivocal behavior in, in the UN. So I think, uh, and the final point is that war, in wars, the purpose of wars changes over time. They can become both more, can become both more extreme and, and, and less ambitious. And I think that's happening with Russia's war aims. It's decided it is now in an in a existential struggle with the West. But on the other hand, it's hinting it may settle for just taking the Donbass rather than annihilating the illicit uh, fascist-dominated Ukrainian regime. So um, both things can be true. Um, inflated rhetoric at one level, but but ve you know, ve very delimited um, area by area negotiating goals at another. Absolutely, especially if, if, if Russia cannot really call this a war, which would be the, the precondition for actually having general mobilization. Yes. They wouldn't be able to do to go that yes. step if but they need people and therefore would have to call up 
everyone yes. to general yes. mobilization, but they can't call it a war because that's not what they're, that it doesn't fit into it's the It's to avoid a war. And I, I've seen um, interviews yeah. with dead, dead soldiers' wives saying, um, I'm, it was unfortunate he died, but I trust the leadership because if we hadn't done this, uh, the, the West would have attacked us in a war. So we're, we're doing this to preempt a war. Um, and that's, that's a, an amazingly successful narrative, even with dead soldiers' families. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the transcripts, um, sort of, um, you know, eavesdropping um, in social media um, conversations as well, um, show you just how sold Russian soldiers' wives are on the on the on the official narrative. Um, I have another question, but first I would like to ask Vicky whether she would like to give us a, 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 a you what you think. Now it's always very difficult to read the runes, but where do you think Ukraine's resistance to some form of ugly peace, as, as, as Paul um, talked about it, might start weakening. Where, do you see any scope for Ukrainians to uh, accept something that is an intolerable peace, really in, in many ways, but maybe the only way of stopping the actual lethal fighting? I know it's not an easy question. I do apologize. You're you're muted. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of maintaining a very, very strong absolutist position as a kind of negotiating technique with the West and allies in order to and get support. Um, for the ongoing campaign, because if they show, you know, so they give an inch, then you have to accept a mile sometimes. And in a way, this they they articulate their position as like protecting or standing and fighting for the West. Um, and so it's it's a kind of a soft power pressure in a way to ensure to help build support to maintain their independence um it it's in terms of finding a way out of that it's very very difficult and i think there has to be some kind of un, there's a great polarization and, and how to bring the polarization how to bring views back to the mainstream when you've got you're in the sort of there's a clash of identities really and I'm I'm really struggling to see the way forward from it because nobody wants to concede anything and that it's a, it is a clash of identities and if the West concedes it kind of undermines its own or will be seen to undermine, undermine its own values to let down people who have made very significant sacrifices um, in their words to protect the West so I think there has to be some kind of compromise, but yeah, people aren't in the mood to compromise. That's... I think, yeah, you're, I, I, I'm very tempted. I, I agree with you. Um, there is, there's, and, and the, the mobilization of the determination to defend yourself on the part of the Ukrainians had to be so intense that to, to start re reversing that threat, that, that, dynamic is going to be incredibly difficult and it's been going on I mean we must not forget this has been going on since 2014 in the in the in the in the in the eastern areas so this is just just in quotation marks a horrible escalation um, and with the uh, war crimes that have been happening that are now beginning to really become very much known and and verified as this this, this these things are happening it is extremely difficult for Ukrainians to, to, to climb down from this. Sadly, I've just been given another minute to wrap this up. We are only beginning to start ha to have a, a, a conversation about the, the, the key themes and would need a bit more time to sort of link three really, the first double presentation and then the next two interesting extremely valuable in the contemporary context presentations together. So I'll actually, I, I'll conclude A, with thanks from me to the panel and um, to everyone who has been instrumental in making this, this, this overall um, session work. 
But then I conclude with um, a, a last word from one of our audience members who says, many thanks to all of the presenters. I agree with what I've just heard, um, i.e. if Russia's ambition along with China is to change the world order that you then that, that Ukraine is the first of many conflicts to come. So we've probably had the good times and things are going to get a lot um, harsher out there and much more difficult, which is another reason for political scientists and historians and philosophers and ethicists and lawyers to work together to try to minimize the um, otherwise potentially horrendous impact that we might be looking at. So thank you for your efforts. And we will now be cut off and have to finish. If you want to meet afterwards, um, the, just the panel, then please ping me and we'll have a quick conflict session. Thank you very much.